Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. So let's talk today about Spellstorm by Ed Greenwood. And uh, yeah, I'm just gonna cover one here. So Spellstorm, I actually made it through, which is unusual for an Elminster book, but it was engaging enough, and I think because it was so quick moving, that really helped a lot. The plot is essentially, uh, there's this lost spell, and I can't remember what it does, but it's this super amazing spell. And it's been found by someone in, I'm pretty sure they're in Waterdeep, or maybe it's Cormir, maybe the next one's going to take place in Waterdeep. In any case, the spell is something super amazing, and basically Mistra has... Elminster kind of safeguard who's going to get it. And she's like, you know, I don't care if they're good or evil, just essentially use your best judgment as to who would use it the best. The person who has it at the beginning is like this magicless merchant guy. And I honestly thought that the story was going to go so that it was going to be like the Maltese Falcon, like the spell wouldn't really be there and there would be some sort of bigger reason behind why Mistra decided to bring all these people together, and, and they're essentially trapped in a house. They have to get through this, like, super magic field in order to get into this house. And then once they're there, you know, it, it, it's, I don't know, it's like Survivor, it's like Last Man Standing, yada, yada, yada. More than anything else, of course, it is Agatha Christie's and then there were none, because it's like a, a mystery around who's causing the murders once the murders start to happen. Because, of course, you get, like, ten wizards stuck in a house together uh, trying to fight over a spell and there's gonna be killing, right? But the fun thing, it's it's like from the time of Troubles. What were those called? Like pockets of wild magic or whatever? And this is similar to that, though I think it is like pure spell plague magic that's going on. And so magic sometimes works, but sometimes doesn't. And I'm just like, well, you'd have to be an absolute moron to cast spells in here. But, like, everybody keeps casting spells, and uh, they only work, like, a third of the time. The rest of the time, something crazy happens, and sometimes it can be terrible for you. But because they're wizards and they're addicted or whatever, I don't know, it, it just keeps going. Some amusing things about this... I can't remember her name, but essentially, Elminster has, yeah, three helpers with him... Uh, none of whom are in the running for getting the spell, but they're just there to help him try to get through this weekend, I think it is, uh, alive and with as few scratches as possible. And one of them is Mermine Lal, who I was excited to see again, because uh, th that I know of, that I remember last seeing her, that was way back in Night Parade, and I really like Night Parade. So it was cool seeing her here in this post-even fourth edition world. Uh, the crazy thing about her is she, like, mentions <laughs> riding out the spell plague by turning into a dragon. And I was like, what? Did I miss something here? And from every Google search that I could find online, basically it's like, this is a story that has not yet been told. <laughs> so whatever the hell's up with that. She's having a far more interesting time than most of the characters. One of his other helpers is a young woman, and I am really annoyed because I can't remember who it is, but she's a ghost now, and she actually inhabits the body of the merchant because he dies very early on, and so it becomes a little bit Weekend at Bernie's. So it's like this mix of Agatha Christie and Weekend at Bernie's. Uh, and the other person is, of course, Mert the Moneylender, who is now has now been one of the Lords of Waterdeep, and there's all sorts of backstory with him because, you know, Elminster's had like 30 books or whatever at this point. All this stuff that I haven't read, and I'm like, oh my god, like, he just keeps throwing shit at these characters, and I, I, I mean, more power to him and everything, but yeesh, it's not... I, I mean, Mermaid Lulls is the one backstory that sounds really fascinating, and apparently it doesn't... I was like, let me know, is this in the Chandral saga? I will read the shit out of that, but no, uh, it is story yet to be told. <laughs> and, and since it seems Wizards is now kind of loosening what... when the fiction can take place, because... You know, that's, um, um, I'm, I'm a member of a, a, a few different realms things online, um, uh, groups and everything. 
And so many people have been excited over the past couple of weeks getting their copy of Timeless, and I don't care, but I, I read the synopsis just in case, and, like, apparently half or maybe even more than half takes place in the past, and it's like, huh, I wonder if this is their way of saying that they're going to kind of loosen their rule about fiction having to be equivalent to where the game is right now, because... I think that would be awesome, like, especially the years in between, what was it, like, 1375 and 1462 or whatever, the years in between 3rd edition and the Spell Plague, I would love to read some stuff about that, see the, kind of the lay of the land and how things changed and so on and so forth, especially with Sembia, but in any case, uh, or, or see the fall of Halrua, how cool would that be, but I digress a lot. I can't remember the original point I was making. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Those are the people who are with him. All of the people vying for the scroll, there are a couple for sure that I think uh, people will recognize. One of them is a Harpel, and I'm, I know Harpels have shown up in Salvatore, I'm pretty sure. And he's like the kind of uh, token good guy, you know? He's the super good guy. He's, his plans to use the spell are completely beneficent to society and yada 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 uh and of course manchun is there and manchun <laughs> apparently can die in every book but he has an army of clones and he uploads his memories to the next clone every time that he dies so that he kind of just keeps going and it's like on one hand, I'm like, oh, are you friggin' kidding me, Ed? And on the other hand, I'm like, well, at least that's kind of a new way of explaining why a character just keeps coming back, right? I mean, on, on Doctor Who, you've got to explain, like, I mean, it was back in 1977, I think, that the Master was on his last body, and since then, the Master has had, like, six other bodies. So you have to keep thinking up new ideas for that to happen, Whereas Ed has a built-in get-out-of-jail-free card for uh, the Master at Manchun, essentially. And speaking of Doctor Who, I don't think I've ever mentioned it before, probably because I've only read, I think, what, two Elminster books all the way through? I, I, I've, I've kind of made it through most of the way on, like, four or five of them now. I think Ed Greenwood's version of Elminster, or his vision of Elminster, is pretty close to the Doctor, but like a like a, a Doctor with a carnal side. Maybe less so uh, at this point, but a, a Doctor with, a, with at least a flirtatious side. Because he can... Uh, do you guys remember that bit on one of the early Futurama episodes with a parody mash, and they have like the Alan Alda bot who goes from like chicanery to maudlin at the flip of a switch. Elminster is the same way as the Doctor, where he goes between sort of childish and, like, will give you the smackdown about the stupidest things because he's been around and he's seen everything. And, it, you know, it's always like, oh, your knickers are showing, my lady. Things will always end with pain. And it's like, oh, my God, come on, get over yourself, Elminster. So it is uh, an odd book because it has so many different personalities, and there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of other characters. I think it starts with ten, uh, and and so the Harpel guy and Manchun are two of them, and then there's like a snake princess and a j just a ton of people uh, who I was trying to keep straight, and I did a very bad job. But the the cast fairly quickly gets whittled down, so that's helpful in keeping everybody straight. But at one point. And I really wonder if Ed's editor forced him to put this bit in there because it's so myriad and Byzantine, the plot, that there's this one point towards the end where basically they're like, okay, who did what now? And it's, it's kind of like the last scene in Clue because Elminster has to be like, okay, so Mr. Pink killed Colonel Mustard in the library with the candlestick, but then... Aunt Petunia killed so-and-so, you know, and, and it's like, it's all listed out because it's not just that there's one murderer, it's that people have been trying to kill each other left and right, and some of them are succeeding, and I was like, I read that section, and I'm like, I still don't follow it, I don't really care, I know who's alive now, let's go from there, bam. And, of course, like, I don't think anyone even gets the spell in the end, is it 
I think Elminster destroys it. I I don't know. I don't I don't even remember how it ends because I'm like I don't care. I really don't care. But I did enjoy the book well enough. And <laughs> and then at another point, oh, this is also very Doctor Who. I'd forgotten about this. At another point, some assassins or whatever steal in and they're supposed to kill Manchun. And Manchun like convinces them that he's the guy who hired them but in disguise and he's like oh i already killed him but i'm glad you're here we're gonna take over the castle and they believe him and i'm like this is this is brilliant because it's so ridiculous it's and then there were none but done at eight times speed and with a you know benny hill sort of insane laugh track in the background which is definitely not my style, but I think it works. I think overall it works. And like I say, it, it just really moved. Like, just getting through this book, it, it felt like it was about half the size that it is because it just moved really, really quickly. And I love that it puts this... I've, I've got it pulled up on my um, internet right in front of me right now while I'm recording. And so I see the first couple of pages and I love that Ed put this like map of the mansion in there as if it was an adventure that was running. And very quickly, I, I like I, I like maps in general, but very quickly I was like, I am not looking at this damn map. Like I, there's no way that I'm going to follow all this. It just is, you know, I, and like, 60% of the damn book takes place in the kitchen, so really what more do you need? That's another thing. This is a very tactile, sensual, like not in a sexual way, but in a, in a sensual way, a very sensual book. Like, it's it's very aware of people needing to eat and what you would need to do to be feeding essentially 14 people at a time through the day. Like, there is a lot of food prep in this book. I, I think it would have been funny if they kept trying to, like, use a create food and water spell and, and you know, like, wild rabbits kept attacking or something like that. But in any case, I, I did really dig this. There weren't that many unnecessary fight scenes, which I appreciated. It was mostly just kind of this tense psychological thriller, but really lighthearted overall. I don't know. Greenwood style is still definitely not my style, but I thought it worked here in a cohesive way, and it was fun enough. So I am happy that I'm not just skipping two of our last three books, and I'm kind of looking forward to Death Masks, although I think that's going to have Storm Silverhand in it. That's that's what, like, the very end is like, I gotta go help Storm in, I think, Waterdeep. I, I think everything's Waterdeep, I guess. And, and, um, and I'm like, oh, well, that doesn't really hold my interest, but whatever. The cover's really cool, so I'm excited about that. Did anybody else feel differently? The same? What, what did you guys think? So yeah, uh, next up, uh, Death Masks, I hope, and uh, also Dawnbringer, or probably just Death Masks. Probably I'll just do another one for it, unless I actually don't read it, because I hate it, and if, uh, if I hate Dawnbringer as well, I'll at least come back here and we can talk some about the game and about some thoughts that I've had recently on the game, and We'll just have a big wrap-up party uh, until, hopefully, Wizard starts putting out stuff that is uh, not just Salvatore. I would be super excited about that, and I would love to see where they go with stuff. And, uh, and, and I'm also thinking of starting up another thing, which I think I mentioned last time, and I don't know, I'm still like 50-50 on that. So I will catch you next time. This is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.